everybody, it's Mrs Ware here and today we are going to be looking at the top five things that you need to know about the poem London by William Blake. Now this video is not going to be going into super close analysis of the quotes, although I have to admit I do actually analyse some of London in my video um, how to analyse word choice, semantic field and lexical field, so maybe have a look at that if you want a bit more close analysis. What this video will do however is make sure that you know the kind of core foundation information that you need to be able to go on to write an essay about this poem. So let's do this. Number one, what is it about? It's pretty simple really. This poem is about a speaker, we don't know who they are, who is walking through London and observing the sheer misery of everybody that lives there. As someone who was born and raised in London, I can empathise. Number two, what are the key themes? There are a few different themes uh, that you want to have a think about for London. So the most obvious one is the oppressive nature of urban life. And uh, when I go through the context of this poem, I'll tell you a bit more about you know how that theme links to that context. You've also got the uh, moral corruption of the youth, but also the moral corruption of the establishment. Again, very closely linked to the context. You've also got the uh, abuse of power, lack of power, so abuse of power by like the establishment, lack of power for the people living in London. And finally, I would say you've got a theme of control. Who controls what? How far do we control things? And how that control leads to us being kind of like limited as well. Number three, what language should I analyse? There are a few great language techniques that would be uh, good to analyse in this poem. First of all, you've got the uh, repetition, marks of weakness, marks of woe, and the kind of always connotations there to weakness and woe. You've got the repetition in every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban. That kind of repetition combined with the range of people that are being affected and how that shows the kind of overwhelming suffering going on in London. You've also got the metaphor in mind forged manacles. So manacles is a, an, an old word for handcuffs. So the fact that they are mind forged, this idea of how we're limited in our thinking by the uh, lives that people are leading in London. You've also got the metaphor of the soldier's sigh running in blood down palace walls, how the palace symbolises like the monarchy and the establishment and the running in blood representative of um, the kind of responsibility, the, the accountability they hold for the suffering and pain of the people that are kind of under them. You've got the uh, juxtaposition between uh, images like chimney sweepers cry every blackening church appalls. Now chimney sweepers, contextually speaking, were usually uh, children, boys. Um, so you've got like the youth there and their suffering being juxtaposed against an establishment like the church that is supposed to care about them, but actually is just disgusted by them. You've also got juxtaposition in lines like youthful harlots curse. So youthful suggesting that their innocence, harlots, their occupation, that's another way of saying prostitute, suggesting that like immoral behaviour, cursing being obviously like swear words, how they're engaging in corrupt and immoral behaviour. So again, that just like destruction of the, the uh, moral quality of our youth. Uh, because it's a job as well, that being a harlot is a job, you could perhaps argue that what's corrupted her is that need for money, perhaps. That harlot's curse is also having um, a wider effect on society as suggested by the very last line of the poem. So the harlot's curse blights with plagues the marriage hearse. Now, blights with plagues is a metaphor suggesting like, like her, um, her language, her way of being is destroying something. And what it's, what it's destroying is the marriage hearse. Marriage obviously being like you know, the unity of two people coming together. But also that juxtaposition, or no, not even juxtaposition, more than that, that oxymoron of marriage hearse and hearse being the vehicle people are taking in when they died. You've got this sense here of like the end of our romantic institutions, our, our family building institutions like marriage. They're being destroyed by the corruption of, in this case, the women in our society, um, the young women that have been 
led astray into the life of being a harlot. So there's lots of different language things going on there, lots of symbolism, lots of metaphorical language, lots of repetition. It's a good one. Number four, what structure should I analyse? We have got some great stuff going on structurally that we can analyse too. So first of all, there's the fact that uh, the stanzas follow a consistent pattern of being four lines each, and that is also matched with a very consistent uh, rhyme scheme as well, uh, an ABAB rhyme scheme. And that consistency in the stanzas and rhyme scheme is symbolic of the consistency of the suffering of living in a place like London. So that's a nice uh, structural point there. I think there's also a space to analyse the privileged positions of the first and last line and the language within that. So in that opening line, I wander through each chartered street. So from the very, very beginning of the poem, there's this kind of uh, juxtaposition between wander, which has more connotations of like freedom and exploration, against the chartered street, the control, the confined. So on the one hand, we get a sense of our speaker of our poem being much more free than the people he's writing about in the poem. And we immediately start to get that sense of the oppression of London. And it's right from the very, very beginning of the poem, too. Number five, what context do I need to know? This is what I promised I'd tell you about earlier. Here we go. William Blake is a romantic poet. That does not mean that he's very good at writing love poems and, you know, surprising his wife with chocolates and flowers or whatever would be considered romantic. Um, instead, it's referring to a literary movement called Romanticism of the 19th century. Romanticism was basically a group of poets who felt that with the Enlightenment era, with the Industrial Revolution, Britain was gaining all of this scientific progress, logical progress, rational thinking, at the expense of our connection with nature and engaging with our emotions. As an English teacher, I can totally get on board with that idea. Um, so basically what romantic poets often do in their poetry is either A, like celebrate nature, or B, condemn kind of urban industrialization and all that kind of stuff. London is definitely in the condemning industrialization category. It's about attacking and criticizing um, how, you know, the establishment have just kind of abandoned us. Everything is so controlled. Everybody's just going through this suffering. Um, you do get kind of hints of the industrialization as well. For example, with the reference to like chimney street, uh, chimney sweeps, um, with the blackening church. So on the one hand, blackening could be a metaphor for like the corruption of the church but it could also be a much more literal reference to um, the blackening of the walls of the church because of all the pollution that's going on in London as well so it is a real kind of criticism of the corruption that has come from industrialized urban life um, and how we've kind of lost our way lost our connection um, it's also just very anti-establishment we're dealing here with um, post the French Revolution um, and not to get too much into the French Revolution, but very basic idea, it's it's about kind of overturning the monarchy and the working classes taking back control. So romantic poets are often also very anti-establishment, anti-royalty, and we see that here. We've got, as I've mentioned already, that like um, runs in blood down palace walls being very anti-monarchy there. So William Blake's romantic views are by far the biggest influence on this poem of London. But it's also important to understand just that historical context of London itself in this time, in the Industrial Revolution, and how it is an incredibly polluted city. It's becoming a very, very big city, chaotic with a lot of different people in it. Um, so he is like representing a kind of I don't know, like, the, the misery side of it, that's more subjective, but certainly in the sense of there being harlots and chimney sweets and everything turning black from the pollution and everything being very kind of chartered and controlled, that's certainly a, a pretty accurate representation of London uh, in the 19th century. So that brings us to the end of this video on the top five things that you need to know about London by William Blake. I hope that was useful and if it was don't forget to hit like and subscribe and if you are studying the AQA power and conflict cluster make sure you have a look at my other videos on the other poems as well and comment down below if there is any way that I can give you some further help. See you later!